<laughs> Talk Recorded live. Hello and welcome to the Castle of Horror interview segment where we talk to writers and creators of today's genre world. From Denver, Colorado, I'm your host, Jason Henderson, creator of the Alex Van Helsing novels from HarperCollins. This week we're talking to R.S. Belcher. He's the author of two acclaimed weird westerns, The Six Gun Tarot and Shotgun Arcana. Nightwise was his first contemporary fantasy novel. He lives in Salem, Virginia, and his new book is The Brotherhood of the Wheel. This is a dark urban adventure fantasy I think of it as a as a horror adventure uh, that takes place in the same world as the book Nightwise, but it's an all new story. It launches a gritty new urban fantasy series about a mysterious society of truckers descended from the Knights Templar. So welcome, Rod Belcher. Hi, Jason. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Oh, I'm so glad that you could join us. Um, I'll tell you what. Straight off the bat, I want people to experience kind of the tone of the book, The Brotherhood of the Wheel. It is brand, brand new, just days old from Tor. So if you could read, like, from just the first paragraph of Chapter 1, and before you do, actually, Chapter 1 is also called 1031. So if you could explain what that is, and then go ahead and give us the first paragraph, that'd be great. Absolutely. Um, Each of the chapters in uh, in Brotherhood are named after 10 codes, which is a uh, a code system that's used by truckers and by... uh, law enforcement um, and first responders. Um, and um, each, so I kind of went through a, a list of 10 codes and, and tried to give each one, uh, each chapter, a 10 code that would you know, represent what was going on. And if I'm not mistaken, and I don't have my little list in front of me, but I think 1031 is like uh, 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 need assistance or in distress, something along those lines. Um, but each, yeah, each code, um, if, you, if you go online and look up 10 codes, You'll see a little list of codes, and hopefully the code will coincide with what's going on in the chapter. So here is uh, the opening to Chapter 1. Jimmy Ossipyle's Peterbilt tractor trailer thundered down dark I-70, relentless as an ugly truth. The big rig's engine was the booming voice of an angry octane god, demanding you lead, follow, or get the hell out of the way. Jimmy navigated the shifting maze of weaving cars. He blew past the shadowed towers of other 18-wheeler cabs, the faces within illuminated by the ghostly green light of instrument panels, speaking their tales to their brethren across the ether of Channel 19. Long haulers wired on caffeine or meth or song or sweet baby Jesus, whatever it takes to keep the gears jamming, the cargo flowing, and the rig between the lines. And the rig between the lines. That's 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 fantastic. The the, uh, the book is written in this sort of, of... Ratatat uh, language that that I think I think works really well for for this world. Um, okay, so a quick question. I'm going to ask you a little bit about the, this world of these these uh, you know these modern day Knights Templar who ride the roads. But first, all this business about the ten codes and all that stuff. Were you into this? I mean, was that were you like a fan of Convoy and that kind of thing? Or, or how well, I'm you? a I'm a child of the '70s. Um, <laughs> probably a child of the '70s. I remember going to see Star Wars, you know, Star Wars first day it opened and and, uh, uh, all that. And there was a period of time, and I grew up in the South, you know, in Roanoke, Virginia, which is right next door to Salem, Virginia. And I grew up in Salem and lived there until very recently. And now I'm back in Roanoke, which is pretty much the same place. Um, And, you know, uh, when I was a kid, um, you know, I I remember, uh, you know, very vividly, uh, some days we'd be playing Cowboys and Indians. Some days we'd be pay, playing Star Trek, which I always got to be Captain Kirk. I was very adamant about that. Uh, and some days we'd be playing Trucker. And that was just, um, I really believe truck drivers are a kind of iconic urban character, a lot like cowboys are. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there was, you know, I, I, there was some, some kind of romanticizing of the, of the occupation when I was a kid. Um, and being a kid of the 70s, we were, uh, around during the CB craze when everybody wanted to talk like a trucker and talk to truckers. And um, uh, there were all these movies that came out, you know, Smokey and the Bandit. And there were TV shows. I remember one with like a monkey or something, like BJ and the Bear, I think. <laughs> you know, there, there's a couple of different, like, really weird little shows that showed up for a couple of years. Moving On was one of them. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I sort of had this, you know, fascination with you know with the with the life and the the job that truckers do because I, I think it's a, a hard life and in a lot of ways it is kind of like cowboys so when I started writing books um, started writing fiction um, 
it, it seems like those are the things that kind of, you know, I gravitated towards. Um, so first two books I did were weird westerns, which is basically taking a cowboy story, you know, taking a cowboy story and really kind of weirding it out. And um, sort of like if, uh, um, oh gosh, I can't think of his name. The, the um, uh, gosh, I just blanked out on one like the iconic, like Louis Lemoore. If Louis Lemoore like wrote Twin Peaks, sure. it was kind of what I was going for. I thought you were going for songs, or I would have said that. I was thinking like. Oh yeah, yeah I was trying to think of the name, the name of uh, a couple of the uh, the more yeah, famous. Louis Lemoore, uh, Zane Gray. Zane Gray, that was it. I, gosh, I, I completely blanked that. I'm sorry, um, but yeah. So, so um, in Nightwise, I had this character show up in one chapter who was a trucker as part of this secret society. My agent really liked the idea. She she loved the idea, and she said, "Can you let me write something about this guy?" So um, we presented the manuscript to well, we presented the idea for the manuscript to Tor, uh, to my editor Greg, Co- Greg Cox, and uh, folks at Tor. Uh, like the idea and greenlit it, and that's how that happened. So the ten codes, I, it's one of the things I I do and I do it in um, the in the Golgotha books as well, the, the westerns. Every chapter in there, um, the, the first two books have been uh, named after tarot cards, and I try to use a tarot card that's associated with something that's going on in the story. So it's like a little Easter egg. If people are into tarot, they can like see the name of the of the card and go, oh, what's going to happen here. And for this one, it was the same kind of thing. I thought I would instead. Now each chapter does have just a number, you know, one, two, three. But I also gave them each a little pin code because I thought it would be a nice little Easter egg to throw in. I like for people to try to figure out where where the heck my chapter titles come from. <laughs> yeah, that's so. that's wonderful. And I love that all the chapters are are these ten codes. You, you mentioned Greg Cox being your editor. It's so crazy to hear that name because I used to write uh, Marvel novels back. Oh back, wow. back at the dawn of time. And yeah. Craig was one of the other writers. I remember yes. he, wrote, he wrote an Iron Man book, and I think he wrote – I could have sworn that he did one about Doc Ock, right? He probably um, did. Greg um, does a huge amount of, of kind of like media uh, tie-in kind of books. Um, he's done the last – he did like the last Superman, uh, Man of Steel. He did the novelization for that. Um, he did the novelization for uh, Dark Knight Rises. Um wow. And he does a lot of stuff. He gets around, okay. That's oh nice. yeah, yeah, and, and he's a wonderful editor. I'm very lucky to have him. Very lucky. <laughs> that's, that's outstanding. Um, so, all right. So the publisher describes the Brotherhood, this world that you were talking about, mm-hmm. as a secret line. I'm going I'm to read this sentence verbatim: a secret line of knights, truckers, bikers, taxi hacks, state troopers, bus drivers, RV gypsies, any of the folks who live and work on the asphalt arteries of America, and they call themselves the Brotherhood of the Wheel. Now, um, I, I, I just want to juxtapose this with, I was thinking about, you, you mentioned the notion of being fascinated by truckers, right, it mm-hmm. was, you know, yeah. growing up in the 70s. And you mentioned that period when America, for whatever reason, whatever crazy reason, <laughs> there was a brief period where, where pop culture be- became briefly obsessed with truckers. Yes, and, it, was, it was kind of weird, too, looking back on it, it's like, what? Happened. What happened? Well, yeah. I mean, remember there was that uh, that song, and and I'd like to see like a timeline that shows how this stuff happens. But first of all, C. W. McCall, I recall, came out with a song called Convoy. Yeah. C. W. McCall was actually the secret identity of an ad man, who was really uh, Chip Davis, who was the guy behind Mannheim Steamroller. And oh wow! Cool. He decided yeah. that uh, that I, I know this is this is. This is such bizarre stuff, but he was like, I'm going to create the perfect trucking song. And he did. <laughs> yes. And he, yes, he did. And, and that song you know, makes I, your blood boil. You listen to it and you just get excited listening I, about this convoy. They're going to, oh, yeah. they're going to bash the gates, you know? Yeah. But anyway, um, yeah, the, all that stuff happened, that song. And then there was a movie and then there was like mm-hmm. the great smoky roadblock and all that. Um, I think, I think when you think now of sort of the gritty, uh, Western noir stuff that we're seeing now. I mean, I think what you're looking at here, the Brotherhood of the Wheel. God, man. I mean, this could be an HBO series like that. I, well, I, I hope if anyone's listening, please, uh, please pass that along because that would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I would love that. Um, but um, you know, I was I was thinking about the urban legends. Uh, you know, the, what sort of stuff did you draw on when you were thinking about okay, what is this this world like? Because you mention urban legend a lot, and people can't write about your book without thinking of urban legends. Well, I can think um, of only one, but I won't talk about it first. I'll let <laughs> go ahead, please. Well, um, I, I had a, I was very fortunate. Um, last Friday, I got to be on Coast to Coast AM with George Norrie, and we spent the time talking about 
um, some of the urban legend stuff as far as like you know, trucker ghost stories and things like that. So yeah. I, um, I tried to I tried to do a lot of research. Um, I had an opportunity to do some ride-alongs, but um, which I may I hope I still get to do. Um, but at the time, uh, my daughter was uh, in and out of the hospital quite a bit, and my mother was very sick. So I really couldn't just jump on the road for a month and and go, and of course. Uh, you know. But um, I did get a chance to talk to a lot of truckers, um, talk to folks in like you know, message groups and boards online and things like that, um, and did a lot of research. And you know, there's actually like a really good book of of like trucker ghost stories and you know weird tales from the highway. Really? Um, yeah. And um, you know, I. I love urban fantasy and legends, and it's all stuff I grew up with as a kid. You know, we all hear. You those said stories. like, uh, like what, what's an example uh, if you can think of one? Of a uh, like a like a like a urban like a like, like a, a ghost, ghost story. story. Like what? What is that? If I mean, you've um, got one towards the beginning of the book that is a trucker ghost story. That yes, and actually, that's that's almost that is a very common one. That that one pops about the um, uh, the the um, phantom hitchhiker. Right. Um, and then they're known by a lot of different names. Um, I think one of them was Resurrection Mary is one of them, and it's a lot of times they're they're regional, so it's like they they're named whatever. Sometimes the lady is in red, sometimes she's in, in white. In Dallas, she's known as uh, I think the Lady of White Rock Lake. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, and, Brunvon used to write about. Well, Brunvon, I don't even. Oh, if he's listening, I apologize, but I don't even <laughs> know if Jan, Jan Harold Brunvon is still alive. Hmm. But he wrote all those books about urban legends back in yes. the nineties, you know. And, uh, and those were awesome. They were really good. <laughs> yeah. Um, in fact, the cool thing about those books, if I recall, was that you know they were they were textbooks really, but in the, the italics were the stories. Somebody would tell a straight up story. So you right. start with that, and then he'd spend the rest of the chapter looking at like very variants on it, and mm-hmm. study it. So if you just want to read a bunch of creepy stories, you can exactly. just go read all the italicized. Off. Yes, and you know, and, and one of the things I, I kind of touch on this a little bit in the book is, um, and actually this came up at a panel I was at this past weekend. I was at Mysticon uh, Convention mm-hmm. in Roanoke, and uh, is, you know, this generation doesn't sit around the campfire with a flashlight and tell scary right. stories. They go on creepy pasta. <laughs> they they write there, um, and some of the stuff that they write on creepy pasta is so freaking good. It yeah. really is. It's, it's scary and unnerving. Now, some of it isn't, but, you know, that's, that's like 90% of anything else. You know, it's, um, but... My daughters are obsessed with creepypasta, by the way. I mean, really? Oh, yeah. Wow. Absolutely. That's cool. Yeah. That's they're very cool. Really but, yeah, yeah so, so basically, you know, this generation, they're... I, I wanted to try to tap into some more contemporary urban myths and, and, and boogeymen. Um, just because the the ones that are, you know, from my generation and... and you know, and further back have been used a lot, but I haven't really seen a whole lot done with you know, for example, black-eyed children, which is mm-hmm. kind of a big thing in the book. And, uh, Actually, Shadow yeah. Uh, tell, tell me. Well, but before you do, I, I just I was thinking. Um, do you think? So it seems to me that truckers have a dual, a dual. Like your main character is a trucker, and he's a hero trucker because he's part of this organization, uh, this this society, as it were. But it's truckers in our our world have this dual uh, reputation. I mean, to some yes. extent, they're pariahs because they're always on the outside. They yes. work a different job than the rest of us. They, their hours are different. They're, every, everything is different. It's constantly moving. Even if we think of them, you know, fondly, they are, they're separated. Oh. You know, absolutely. It, yes, it's, absolutely. And, and, and it does attract, I think it attracts the best and worst uh, right. people. Um because it is it is a career that gives you lots of time to yourself, yeah. um, which if there's bad and actually in the first chapter, uh, Jimmy Ossipile, the the kind of the our, our main character, sort of the person you're you serve your every man. Jimmy is chasing down one of these bad truckers, um, yes. who is a very bad trucker. He's a serial killer, and he's been yeah. picking up prostitutes. That was really great. I, I, I th- it starts with this very exciting. Uh, hunt for a serial killer trucker who and actually the the guy in question the the the, the character that I have that he's chasing he calls himself the marquis um that character is based on a real world truck driver who hmm. was yes was traveling around uh America on his route picking up women uh sometimes prostitutes other times hitchhikers just whoever he could get a hold of and murdering them 
and uh, he had converted the back of his the cab of his pickup truck into a torture chamber, a medieval cell torture chamber, yeah. so he could, could work on these people. And I read that, and and part of me was just horrified. It was like this is so horrible, and part of me is like that you know that, that sounds like something a supervillain would do or something. It's like right. it doesn't even sound like it's real, but it, the, the scary part is it, it was real. So you're right. Yeah. There is a there's a kind of a you know sort of the um, the besides the sort of the night of the road there's there's also the um you know sort of dark image of the truck driver you know popping pills to stay awake um yeah. driving through the night kind of a loner uh maybe you know a little on the edge of, of sanity there and and then you know it, just like anything else um any other occupation every occupation attracts the good and the bad and um one of the things that also pops up in the book, which is also based in, in reality, is the FBI, um, part of their behavioral science uh, division they have at Quantico, has something called the uh, Highway Serial Killer Initiative, which basically tracks serial killer. Well, they track disappearances and, and murders along the, the highways of America, and they look for patterns because a lot of serial killers use the highways to their advantage to pick up someone in one state murder them, drop them several states away and hide the body. And it may be years or decades before that body is found. Right. And, um, and, it, and it's in several different juris- law enforcement jurisdictions. So the Serial Killer Initiative was a way of, of trying to track that. And the, it, it started in the 90s. It's, as far as I know, it's still in business. But basically, uh, one of the little quotes that they throw out is that they figure that at any particular time, there's about 200 serial killers using the highways in America. Which is Active funny because serial. I think there's this concept people have that serial killers are really quite rare, but in a country of of over 300 million people, nothing's completely right. You know, even, even, even rare things happen hundreds of times right. a year. And um, and you know, law enforcement, you know, the FBI used to say that mafia was a myth because they didn't want to admit that an organization like that could exist under their nose. Right. So it's in law enforcement's best interest to keep the panic. Down. Right. <laughs> so they usually, I would imagine, lowball tend to lowball um, statistics on things like like a stranger coming up and grabbing you and murdering you. Um, right. That would be something that would probably kind of. Uh, it's just well, not good on for any you know. Day, the odds are quite low. The odds yeah, are, yes, it is. It is. It's no. pretty. I mean, it's pretty statistically um, uh, very low to, to have something like that happen to you. But it it does happen, and the thing is, is a lot of times it happens to the people that society doesn't. The vulnerable. Notice if they're if they're the vulnerable people yeah. who really don't have a lot of family because they, maybe they're coming from a abusive home or something like that. They're drifting, and those are exactly the most vulnerable people. And that's usually predators tend to try to look for weak prey. And you talk about about this this uh, one prostitute who's a victim of the of the serial killer, and she actually is going through the various options in her head, and she says. That she figures at first what it might get, what might happen is she might get raped and she might get beaten up, and tossed out of this truck and be injured, because that happens, she says, about a couple of times a month. And I was thinking, really, is that? Uh, I, my my question is, is that true? That 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 kind of regular regular brutalization is happening, and also that it's the kind of brutalization that people literally would take into account as they make their plans. Um. Prostitutes who deal mostly with, with truckers are there's a, a, a coin for them. Lot lizards is the is the um, pejorative. So rough. And and the, basically the you usually the way it works at most of the major truck stops. Um, and some truck stops are really nice. But one of the actually one of the things I kind of liked about the whole idea of trucker society, this kind of you know subculture of the trucker, is they have their own little fortresses off the highway. They have these tru- huge truck stops where they have showers and bunks, and sure. they have their own sections where they can eat at, where they can talk with other truckers. But um, it's pretty well known that in most truck stops, if you park along the back row of the truck stop, you are inviting a company, and companies really? can be drug dealers, it can be prostitutes. Um, and and basically, so the back row in the darkest part of the of the the lot is is where that sort of thing happens. Um, I don't have a great deal of and all my all my information is anecdotal. There's nothing like I can you know, pull out a statistic. But um, there's a a really great novel, and it is complete fiction. Though when it was originally written and published, it was uh, it was purported to be uh, factual. 
Uh-huh. It was a same, I'm trying to, God, oh my God, I just completely blanked on the name of it, but it was basically a memoir of a uh, transgender uh, prostitute, trucker prostitute. Really? And uh, yeah, and I'm, I'm so sorry I'm blanking on it, but it was, it was presented as, um, as factual. It turned out later it was all the creation of the, of the, the writer. Um, she, the whole thing was fiction. But it was really damn good fiction. <laughs> and it was based in based in, in reality and um you know a prostitute's life is pretty risky and and, and pretty uh, dangerous and you combine that with your clientele are men who are traveling from place to place and are only going to, are only going to be in your vicinity in your geography for maybe you know less than a day yeah. um so uh, women who you know do prostitution uh work uh, do tend to get abused and hurt, and I have heard that you know it is it can be dangerous work, especially being. Well, a, of course a, it can. I, the the part that that just struck me is the sort of blase sort of, sort of she's used to this sort of happening. Yeah. Yeah. It's, just and that and, and unfortunately that part is is based in fact that is unfortunate. But um, I I actually tried to research some some interviews and stuff with prostitutes and. Uh, and, and specifically, like trucker prostitutes, folks who you know deal in, in uh, their their uh, territory, um, their turf is kind of the the back lot of, of of truck stops, and that sort of thing happens a lot. They'll get uh, beat up, and thrown out of the truck. Uh, they'll get ripped off. They don't get paid for for services rendered. Um, and if you draw the wrong driver, if you get someone who is one of these this minuscule little, you know, percentage that are that are sure. you know multiple killers or you know they they are could be a serial rapist. Um, those folks end up in sometimes a lot worse places than than just getting beat up. So, um, I, I you know I, I try to you know I I don't try to make uh, all of the truckers' lifestyle uh, shiny and and uh, and all uh, sweetness and light. There are some, you know, some rough edges to it, and um, yeah. what what I think I find interesting is how many truck drivers I got to, you know, talk with and, and kind of get to see into their world a little bit, who are who are decent family men, who they could park on the back lane and and probably do some of that stuff, but don't, and that, I mean that speaks a great deal to, you know, I'm I'm really fascinated by kind of the best and the worst in, in people, and it's always uh, it, and Jimmy is supposed to represent more of like the best in us. Um, He really is genuinely a decent guy, but not every trucker is going to be like that. (laughs) Well, not every anything is. Well, exactly. Precisely. There's going to be be wonderful librarians and evil librarians. Yeah. Do you remember a story from, uh, I can't can't remember if Rune Vaughn did this, but it was well known. The the story of the trucker who saves saves the woman's life as they're driving around and, uh, God, I mean, that's the spoiler, by the way, of the, the story. The story goes backwards. It starts with the woman, and this trucker behind her keeps shining a light to that, that blinds her, and she thinks he's trying to run her off the road or, or mess with her. Oh, and yes, 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 yeah. And, and they finally and, pull into a gas station, and she runs out to run inside and report the manager because this trucker is harassing her. And the trucker runs to her vehicle and pulls an assailant out of the back of the car where he's been, you know, Yes, lurking. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. you know that's the vision of of well, it's double vision. It's the trucker as savior, but also trucker as distrusted person. Yeah. You know, um, there was which a, is so much uh, like a cowboy. You know, you exactly. talk about cowboy myths, right? Yeah. You know, Shane can't be part of society because exactly. he's you know he's he's out there. Um, but uh, uh, okay. Tell me, uh, the last thing I wanted to ask you about is uh, the black-eyed children. This is your main sort of threat in this book, right? So what's going right. on? Um, well, like I said, I wanted to try to do some, some urban myth that had not been done all, a great deal. And I hadn't heard a whole lot of – I'm sure there's fiction out there with black-eyed children, no doubt. Um, but nothing, you know, that jumped up and, and kind of, you know, greeted me. So I, I thought that might be fun territory to explore. And um, I always – and kind of – with the black eyed children, I was also using shadow people, which has also has been documented to be, you know, something that's been around for a long time, but it's kind of come to the forefront in the last say 10, 20 years or so, um, which are basically people who appear to be made of nothing but shadow. And 
Um, some, you, can, you can see one of these in broad daylight, and they, it looks like someone just like cut out part of, cut out the outline of a person and just filled it with just black. Um, so, I um, uh, black-eyed children uh, started popping up in the mythology in uh, the 90s. Uh, normally, it goes uh, two two children, um, usually like in a hoodie or just dressed like normal kids, come up to someone in their car, maybe in a parking lot. Uh, the first uh, recorded uh, occurrence was a reporter who was in his car in a uh, empty parking lot, and he was basically fumbling around doing something with his phone or whatever. And he looks up, and there are these two kids standing right by his driver's side window, and they tell him, "You know, uh, can you give us can you give us a ride home?" And the guy, um, one of the one of the hallmarks of the myth is that um, there's immediately a a great sense of of fight or flight. You get this sudden this terror fills you for some reason. Your body is screaming for you to run, but your mind's going, what, what is this? It's a couple of kids. Um, usually about that point, the, the person who is encountering these individuals notices their eyes. Their eyes are completely inky black and featureless. And um, the children tend to talk in sort of a monotone. And um, a lot of times they, they talk in unison. In unison. Um, and then they start saying, you know, take us home, open your door, let us in, which I think is interesting, too. That's another part is they always, sometimes they'll knock on someone's house door, and you open the door, and there are these two kids, and they're saying, let us come inside. We need to use your phone. Let us come inside. And they have to be invited in. That, that's a very interesting part, which harkens back to, like, the vampire myth. Sure. Um, so, anyways, usually there's this huge welling of terror. There's oftentimes almost a hypnotic desire to, to open your door, unlock your car door, and let these things in. The, the, of course, the punchline is, is we don't know what happens to any of the people who let the black-eyed children in because we, we don't know what happened to them. Um, so it's an interesting mythology and uh, urban myth. It's, it's, it's popped up in a whole lot of places. Uh, it seems to be primarily based and started out in the United States and in the southern, southern United States, which just made it even more interesting to me. Oh, it's um, perfect, yeah. And um, and then basically, um, I decided to use Black Eyed Children as as one of the uh, kind of linchpins in the book. That basically um, our heroes find out that there are these no, several cases of missing children happening in different parts of the United States, and they begin to think that there may be a connection between these missing children and Black Eyed Children. And um, that's kind of you know part of the mystery that they're trying to unsolve or they're trying to solve in the in the book. So, um, but yeah. Uh, one last question. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't interrupt you. No, 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 please go ahead. So w- when you're when you're right, like, are you working on the next Brotherhood book right now? Um, right now I am uh, working on the third Golgotha book. Um, uh-huh. And uh, then I'm, uh, after that, I'm committed to the sequel to Nightwise. Yeah. And then in the winter, I'll be writing the next Brotherhood of the Wheel book. So I but always ask you- of everybody, when you have to do work every day. What's your method? Do you go out? Do you work at home? What do you do? Um, I work at home. I'm very fortunate in that. And I have two kids. Um, one's 19. My son's 19. My daughter's 14. And um, I was very fortunate in the last couple of years because my mother passed away last March, but we were able to take care of her for a couple of years while she was you know, having decline. And I'm very... I, I will never... You know, that time was invaluable. It was. It was really... You know, uh, so many people have to you know deal with that situation, and they also have to deal with trying to get to their job, trying to get time off from their job when their their parents in the hospital or, um, or, or you know if they need home care. So I'm very thankful that I'm able to work at home. Um, That's great. And uh, basically, I, I have a I take a laptop with me. Like tomorrow, I'm headed out to a signing in Richmond, Virginia, and uh, I'm going to uh, take my laptop with me and work in the hotel when I'm not you know, not doing the signing. Um, sure. Tor has me doing a lot of promotional stuff this month. I'm very thankful for that. I really enjoy this. And I'm, I'm have, uh, thank you for inviting me on your show. I, I really enjoy doing stuff like this. But um, I have to keep on a schedule. I have, you know, you basically, no one's got, no, you don't have a boss over your shoulder saying, why aren't you working? Get back to work. Right. You have to right. keep yourself on task as best you can. So what do you work. try to do a day when you're, when you're working on a book? Um, I try to do somewhere in the neighborhood of maybe a thousand words a day. Um, some days you get more in, other days you get nothing in. Um, right. A couple, like last week we had some ice storms here where our power was out for three days. And oh that threw, that's threw, threw, us, threw me off. How do you uh, feel with the, the refrigerator when your power is out? I mean, how does that, 
How does that um, work? <laughs> you you just kind of you know you end up like tossing a lot of stuff when the power comes back on, basically. Um, but you know it it you have life happen, and um, it is uh, I, I love my job. I am very very fortunate to do what I get to do. Um, but when I was doing nonfiction, when I was doing journalism and stuff like that, which I did for about twelve years. Um, you know, you have an editor and a deadline. And I have the same thing. I, when, when I sign the contracts for these books, I have committed to a certain, to delivering a manuscript of a certain size at a certain, around a certain date. Um, yeah. the, you know, they are very understanding that, you know, this is not a, a precise science and that you know, sometimes you may need a little more time to get the manuscript in. Um, like I said, my editor, Greg, is, is absolutely fantastic. And, and I think we have a very good working relationship. He's a, a great guy. And very supportive, and uh, um, so basically, yeah, I try I try to get in as much as I can every day. Um, if I can get in a thousand words or more a day, I I feel like I've at least accomplished. And when I was writing my first novel, I was working uh, three jobs at one point during all of that, and I would literally come home so tired, and I would get on the laptop, and I would if I got a paragraph written on the on the book. I would be happy. Sometimes I would fall asleep on the laptop. I <laughs> wake up in the morning to find, oh, I, I managed to get a couple of paragraphs in. That's awesome. Uh, so it's it is not an exact science, but I, and my process is I usually you know try to uh, write when my kids are are doing their own thing. Um, I uh, I like to listen to music when I'm when I'm writing. Uh, and music plays. Um, it actually it depends on the day and what I'm writing. Um, if you do read Nightwise or um, Brotherhood. Uh, both of them, uh, you can see where music pops up in there a lot. Um, I like everything. Um, I like uh, a lot of older country. Um, oh, like yeah. William Senior and, and stuff like, like that. I like Marty Robbins. Uh, I like like I, I'm a child of the 70s and 80s, so I was huh. uh, uh, Bauhaus, uh, uh, everything. And my son, fortunately, is a is a hipster, so he. Uh, keeps me uh, at least moderately in tune with with what people are listening to now. So I've listened to things like Cage the Elephant and uh, just all kinds of stuff. I, I I really do enjoy a lot of different kinds of music, and I'm always trying to find new stuff. And um, some things are just. Do you find it affects things. how how you're writing a scene to have like like uh, like a, a song. Like I know that some people when they're writing listen to a lot of movie screenplays, for instance. Because it's rhythmic and it's intense, but there's no lyrics to like to like bog your brain down. You know? Yes, I do. I like listening to trance right. and uh, and stuff like that because trance or classical it depends on the day. Um, but right. those are both good because they don't completely distract you, but they do put you in. A, and I do believe when I write, there really is like a rhythm to it. It's like music, and you can sure. tell when you've hit a beat, and you can tell when you've hit like a clunker. Um, and, yeah, yeah. But no um, um, but there's like a scene in Brotherhood. Uh, set in a diner um, that uh, involves kind of like a, a big fight scene in a diner. It's kind of a creepy setup for the scene. Um, and when everything kind of goes to hell and, and the bullets start flying, um, I had this one song in my head, and it and it comes and I have it out playing on the jukebox in, in the What's scene. What's the song? I'm with, it's um, the old man down the road by oh, um, yeah, John Cassidy. Uh, Fogarty. No, yeah, no. yeah, uh, no, Fogarty. Um, uh, Dan Fogarty. I think it's no Dan Fogarty. No Dan Fogarty was Grizzly Adams. Uh, John Fogarty. <laughs> yes. John Fogarty, yeah. And I must have played that damn song probably 50 times. Wasn't down the road. Wasn't that the one where uh, they sued him because it was very close to Run Through the Jungle? And so, Yes. Um, yeah, it uh, is. Exactly. And I love that song, too, actually. That's a good one, too. Yeah, I mean... I mean, But it sounds a lot like it, yeah. It was he had so he much trouble with management. saying that he didn't rip himself off. It's the weirdest <laughs> case. It was totally... This actually happened about... I want to say about 25 years ago. Yeah, because um, he put that he put that solo album and it did pretty well. He had some hits off of it, and um, that's, a great, that's a great song, "Old Man Down the Road." Yeah, and it's just a good it's a good setup for, um, like I said, oh, I like Southern rock. I mean, I I grew up in the South. I I really enjoy like Leonard Skinner and, and sure. old stuff like that. So I mean, um, and it's it's good music for when you're writing about people like racing down the highway and yeah, no, you know, sure. And all that stuff. So um, try to try to keep a 
I, I, I try to keep abreast of what people are listening to now. And, but it, it really is, if I hear something I like, I, I don't care if it's like 20 years old or it just came out. If I like it, I like it. And yeah. it'll, it might end up in one of my books. You never know. <laughs> I, sh- I should mention, uh, before we go, you should check out uh, Portlandia. This, uh, like, uh, I think two episodes ago, they had a whole gag about Southern rock um, soundtrack oh, awesome. TV series. <laughs> So I, I love really Portlandia. I am way behind in watching it, but I I I, I hope to someday do a uh, signing at Women on Women uh, bookstore. Oh I'm my God! No <laughs> joke. No kidding. <laughs> yes. I would um, love to and do by that. the way, I, we're we're out of time, but you you've got a wonderful main uh, female character in here in the uh, uh, in Lavina. So. Oh, uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Really great. Uh, all right. I really appreciate you spending time with us. Um, I and and I, I hope we get a chance to to talk again. And uh, the book is called The Brotherhood of the Wheel by R. S. Belcher. It is uh, very exciting and very interesting and fresh. And, and I hope we we hear a, a lot more about it. So well, have a so fantastic much, uh, evening. And you too. Uh, and and uh, thank you for having me on again. And would love to come back anytime you you care to have me. Absolutely. Have a fantastic evening. Bye. You too. Thanks. Bye bye.